Hi everybody, this is me. I am here now and uh, this is Earth Day. And uh, I always like Earth Day. I'm very fond of it and, and don't, don't let my hairdo throw you. <laughs> because it happens also to be the birthday of my youngest son, who I believe the first Earth Day was 1970, I think. And my son was born in 68 on April 22nd. So I considered it auspicious from the beginning. And um, I've always taken Earth Day very seriously, naturally. Well, not only because I have a brain and I realized that we're wrecking the Earth and we're going to be in dire straits in another decade if we keep going like this, letting, letting ourselves be enslaved by the fossil fuel companies and countries. If this goes on for another decade, we're really pretty sunk, I'm afraid. All of us, not already, I think people in Africa and the Middle East, Pakistan, those areas where they get 130 degrees, things like that. I think they're pretty close to done. But I think we'll all be done for sure if we... Uh, uh, now, I, today I have a background which is out the window. A nice pine tree and some newly budding trees early springtime in the Catskills. And then I have Hevadra and Yamantaka and Chakosamba and Vajrapani behind me. And Zonkapa, if I move a little this way, you can see Zonkapa. And uh, <clears throat> by my mentor, my historical mentor. I mean, among my many mentors, but he's the lead one for sure. And uh, lived, he began the, Renaissance, the first Renaissance the one the Westerners called the Renaissance, starting in the 14th, 15th centuries. And this guy was 1357, 1419. His enlightenment was 1398. And he had 21 years then of giving Renaissance-type instructions of be enlightened now and take care of life and enjoy life and take care of others. And... Uh, uh, which is, I think, the energy of the Renaissance. Instead of being groveling under some god who you have to... Oh, and his representatives, his supposed representatives, uh, like the church, different churches and whatever, and in other cultures, other kinds of churches and gods. But um, Renaissance was where we have to take responsibility, kind of like that, and we can. And it's wonderful and beautiful to do so. And now we're under the false god of the fossil fuel companies and the dictators that they like to support. So they can keep pumping and keep floating in money, which will also be good for stuffing their coffins, because they are equally die with the rest of us, however rich they may be, if we keep going like this. So anyway, I love Earth Day. And in those days, I used to think of the Buddha who, when challenged by the devil, Mara, the tempter, <clears throat> not to be a Buddha, like why, how dare he be a Buddha sort of thing, he counter-challenged Mara by saying, well, you Mara, he told him a great teaching, he said, you Mara are the king of the Maras, head devil, because you were once altruistic. And I remember that previous life, long before your selfish Mara behavior, when you are altruistic, and because of that little bit of altruism, you now are king of the Maras. Oh, great, says Mara, you're the devil, Mara. He, you remember that. You're my witness then. But now you say you did all kinds of things for every being alive, including humans, animals, beings in hells, heavens, gods, whoever, whatever kinds of beings. You did fantastic things for them forever, and now you want to be a Buddha to help them become Buddhas. But where's your witness of all those things you say you did? So the Buddha then touched the earth. He reached his hand over his knee and he touched Mother Earth, tapped her on the shoulder, and Mother Earth came out of the earth, although she had a she, upper part of her body did, in the, in the way they presented. And she began to recite to Mara, and actually, in some versions, she had a whole chorus of earth goddesses with her in her retinue, and they all chanted the, the former life stories of the Buddha 
Jataka tales, where the Buddha gave his body, gave his life, gave his head, gave his ears, gave his eyes, gave his blood, gave his bones, gave his family, his wife, his children, his uh, <coughs> land, his kingdom, his palace, whatever beings asked, he gave it to them. And also other things, that not just the giving uh, virtue, but all the other virtues he did for all the other beings. He was correct with them and properly ethical with them, and he, he absorbed their injuries on him without rancor, without hatred, without re retaliation and revenge. And so Mara, Mother Earth gave all that witness. And uh, so that's how I first thought of Sorry, Earth Day. I, I thought it fit very me. well with Buddha, with, with his love for Mother Earth and his thing. I didn't yet at that time have the great example of Thich Nhat Hanh's wonderful book of his love letter to Mother Earth. <laughs> and I hadn't also experienced my own kind of love letter to Mother Earth, which just happened to me recently in a new way. And I'm going to tell you a little story just to celebrate the day. Uh, then you can, while I'm talking, you can look at the trees and the sky, you know, it's, it's a nice day. Well, I was reading the Flower Ornament Sutra, and I was reading about uh, the Bodhisattva, uh, all Bodhisattvas who are at a certain stage, but particularly, I guess, the Bodhisattva who became Vairochana, who is the cosmic Buddha of this sector, and Shakyamuni Buddha in that sutra is, is a, one of the many million, zillion emanations of uh, Vairochana. But on the other hand, Shakyamuni himself emanates millions and zillions. So in a way they're the same, the way one is emanation of the other, and the way they're equal. They're all inconceivable, the Buddhas. You can't say anything about it. So, uh, <coughs> I was reading this, and then, in that it was going on to, in grisly detail, how bodhisattvas will give their bones, their head, their eyeballs, their body, and all this to other beings who ask them for it. And then I sort of realized as I was reading that such bodhisattvas would have some issue with the fact that whichever cannibal asked him for his body that to barbecue him, which he would then give, and don't freak out and don't imitate, because such a being who can do that is a being who is uh, completely lives in a different relationship with the body. They, they adore the body, etc., but they know that the body is not the whole of them. So they, they, it's a wonderful part of them, but they, and they love it. It's not that they're against it. But they can also give it away because they'll have always another body. They'll make many bodies. And they know that the mind will always be in a body, in an energy body. And the human energy body is very, very precious and valuable, incredibly so. And they know that, so they don't lightly surrender it. But they can also easily leave it, with, and just, here, you have it then, if you need it, type of person, which is not like us. <laughs> not at all, you know, because we so much identify with, and we think our body is our real reality. But, and it is our reality, but an unreal reality, that's the difference, okay? It's less real for them. And it's, that doesn't make it less wonderful, you know, like you can have an awesome aesthetic experience in a play, or in a theater, or in a film, and, uh, and be totally into it, even though you know it's in some sense less real than if uh, Hamlet was running around on the battlements in the flesh, right? So, uh, so that doesn't mean, less real doesn't mean less valuable. It's also very, very valuable. Because also it's made of the ultimate reality, but I don't want to go into that. We're on Earth Day. I'm not going to go into ultimate clear light of the void philosophy, although I know many of you may like that. But that, that doesn't, the fact that the, even Earth, we could then give up Earth. If giving up Earth would save thousand other Earths with a million other billions of other trillions of other people on them, we'd be happy to give away and give away Earth if someone asked for it. But actually, our attachment to it, at least, you know. But actually, here's the thing. I'm back to my Eureka moment. And that Bodhisattva would have issue with the fact that that cannibal family would only have one barbecue. And then they'd have to go look for another Bodhisattva to eat, you know, for breakfast the next day. 
uh, unless he was very fat and they could eat him for three days. So that was frustrating to him because he couldn't stand, or she, she, he, she, couldn't stand in different lifetimes having, you know, anybody else be hungry. There's also other cannibals who couldn't eat the one little body. So the whole ingenious thing of fabricating a planet, which is a, a living entity that seems inanimate to us in our categories, but actually is a living entity filled, teeming with life always in its history. And uh, of course, temporary, like all constructed things, it deconstructs at some stage. And just the right distance from a warming sun, a cooling earth, you know, like with enough water and the atmosphere in a certain way, I mean, quite complicated thing to produce. But she decided, I want to be that. I want to be one of those. And so she worked with all the powers of the universe and um, all the beings who would be living on it also. And uh, that's such a bodhisattva. And she made herself into Mother Earth. So to me, that was a big eureka in that Mother Earth is not only a goddess, she Gaia, you know, in the, in the Greek, or Purtivi in Sanskrit, like Persephone, but she is also a bodhisattva who wants to feed beings and think of the trillion beings, including all the animals, if you include them, all the animals, the insects, the fish, trillions of beings that she can feed as a bodhisattva, you know. And then in a Buddha, I guess, you sort of support trillions of bodhisattvas also. I mean, countless. I mean, you can't find the number, as I found later in the sutra. Anyway, just as I was enjoying that epiphany, I get a phone call one week later. My grandson, one of my grandchildren, calls me and says, Grandpa, me and May, his beloved, uh, we just had a daughter. We're so happy and proud. And we're calling Grandpa to see if you approve of the name. And I was quite surprised. I, my grandson had not always asked me about the name or anything. And I said, well, of course I approve it preemptively, but what is it, you know, yeah, just for fun to know? And they said, Kaya. <laughs> I was so delighted. And uh, because this is the and now here we are on the day of Gaia. And it's her Gaia's first birthday. It's only a month or two ago. And little did I realize that Thich Nhat Hanh was way ahead of me, as usual. And he wrote a love letter to Mother Earth and realized she's a great bodhisattva, as well as a goddess. A little later in the Flower Ornament Sutra, in the Ten, Ornam in the Ten Stages Sutra, I read how bodhisattvas, when they reach a certain ones of the Ten Stages, then they like to be reborn and accumulate more merit as a bodhisattva by doing more things for others. They like to be born as gods and goddesses because as the gods and goddesses, they can help beings more broadly than the single, even, the, even a world emperor can do as a human. Although for many lifetimes, they are born as world emperors uh, or local emperors and or as just great people uh, to help others, you know. But uh, one of the other things they like to do is be born as Brahma, for example, the, a, a Brahma god in a particular world that each one has, a high god called the Brahma, who himself says, I'm not the creator, although we all are created in this, any more than you are, in that we all create the world together in the Buddhist view. It isn't one being's responsibility, soul responsibility, and therefore there's no soul omnipotent. Buddha himself is not a soul omnipotent. Buddha is the closest to omni Buddha is omniscient and therefore closest to omnipotent, but even Buddha is not omnipotent. Buddha depends on those who need a Buddha. Otherwise there wouldn't be any manifestation of Buddha. Buddha would just be clear light, infinite bliss energy, which is what the universe is made of. It isn't anybody's bliss, it's everybody's bliss. Okay, so there we are, Mother Earth, Earth Day. Now on this day, uh, and at noon, there's going to be a wonderful meditation of Losang Temba. If you go to www.thus.org or tibethouseus.org and look up programs, you'll find a meditation at noon from this wonderful Russian monk. Uh, and I urge you to do so, which you will really enjoy that meditation. And 
<clears throat> also, there is a conference in Dharamsala called Dialogue for Our Future, where they've had already half of it has gone by. But if you look it up, www.dial or just 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 Google Dialogue for Our Future, and you can get a few sessions. If you're on the east coast of the U.S., it's very late at night or early in the morning, 3:30 a.m., running through about nine or nine o'clock because of Indian time. And they may play it again afterwards because they're recording as they go, but it's quite wonderful also. So, you know, we the, the Tibetan world, the Tibetan culture world, which I also represent in as Tibet House, the Dalai Lama's cultural center in the U.S., uh, is very gung-ho about Earth Day, based on Buddha being gung-ho about all the Bodhisattvas, about Mother Earth herself being gung-ho about her day. What we are thinking every day is her day, of course, but we are thinking of it as her day. And um, so you can find out lots of things about how doable keeping below 1.5 degrees centigrade and even reversing it, getting back to a more normal, more balanced uh, temperature is going to be. We can do it. If we'd started 30 years ago, if the oil oligarch and uh, uh, demonic people had not uh, the Lee Raymonds, the Joe Manchins, the uh, uh, Charles and David Cokes of this world, if they had let Rex Tillerson's, if they had let us do it, been honest with us and let us do it, we would be well out of the woods by now and, and we would be not be having these extreme weather events. And you people in middle America whose roof is torn off and grandmother got killed by the last tornado and everybody, you wouldn't have to suffer those things. You know, there are other things we'd be suffering, of course, but we wouldn't be suffering these extreme weather things in this way. This is really a, a punishment and a torture inflicted upon torment inflicted upon all of us and all the animals and the extinct extinguished species and things by these fossil fuel tyrants and dictators, you know. And the fossil fuel is just a technology thing that has enabled people with a particularly high wrong kind of egocentrism, you know, short-sighted egocentrism, because it's egocentric to want to be a Buddha too, and that's good egocentric, so don't think it, we're all supposed to be no ego, no, no ego. That's also a false idea. We're supposed to be really good selves and good egos and good persons who say, I love you to the world, to the life, to ourselves, to everyone. But the I has to be strong for the love to be strong. So it's all right to have an ego. Don't worry about it. Don't think, oh, some crazy Buddhists want me to be a vegetable. No. Although, actually, <laughs> vegetables are have them too. And they are also quite nice, mostly. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's my second story. And since then, I've been going around, and I will ensure you, assure you, ensure and assure you that Mother Earth's emanation is a great-granddaughter, my second great-granddaughter, mother great-granddaughter Gaia. So Mother Earth, to show us, to lead the way, that she intends to continue to support life, human as well as non-human, has incarnated as one of the humans, as a beautiful girl called Gaia. <laughs> and, she, and her parents thought they thought it up, but actually she suggested to them in their dreams that she be called Gaia just so people would know who she was. So because of that, that is a symbol and a warrant and a promise that we will succeed in what we, many, we often, when we, I too, and we all emotionally sometimes think, when like when Joe Manchin won't allow a filibuster, when a person like that, just because he has a couple of little coal mines and he won't do it, or he's called up and flattered by people who don't actually care for him, big oil barons like Charles Koch or whoever it may be, people from Texas. So so don't be despaired. And I'm telling myself and I'm telling you because we can easily do it. And there were some wonderful people in that thing coming from Dharamsala. Now also we at Tibet House, we're going to do, there is one huge thing on Mother Earth that everybody knows about actually. And those of, those in the environmental movement know that it's very related to our situation in the Americas, uh, who are relatively fortunate, actually, compared to people in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in, uh, in South, South Asia 
um, really in de- and people on islands in the, in the Polynesia, it's really Micronesia. They're in really really bad condition compared to us. So we're very very lucky. But one place in South Asia or in Asia that is really really important is what is called the Third Pole. Now, of course, we all know the the north the the Arctic ice is gone in the summers now which is, you know, hasn't happened in hundreds of thousands of years. And it's pretty gone, and the polar bears are very much needed. They need an outboard and a kayak, you know, to get out to their summer food. And, uh, and the Antarctica, even bigger than the North Ice thing, Antarctica is also going down. And that'll raise the oceans. That's one of the terrible things if we don't stop it, which we will. But if we don't, that's going to happen. But there's a third pole, what is known as the third pole. And that is the whole Himalayan massif. And uh, the vast, uh, it goes all the way from Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush, and all down through North India and southern part of Tibet. And uh, then, in a way, the Kunlun is a little bit one edge of it. The northeast edge is the Kunlun. And, um, you know, dividing uh, Tibet from uh, Uyghuristan, Turkestan, or bo- both of which are colonies of China at the moment, but they are separate indigene uh, areas. And um, the ice mass of those vast Himalayas, as you all know, I think, the tectonic plate representing the Indian subcontinent and some of Southeast Asia hit the Asian tectonic plate geologically, you know, I don't know how many million years ago, but many here, and went under it, and that pushes up the Himalayas, pushed up the Himalayas, so they're the youngest mountain mass. That's why they're the highest. And uh, they, um, they're growing, actually. They continue to grow because the, somehow the slow thing, they grow at a couple of inches or centimeters every year. And they have this huge amount of ice. And that huge amount of ice is what melts in the summer after the monsoons of India and Southeast Asia and Southern China. And, um, and then when there's no rain, not much rain, in other words, in those areas, farmers and everybody can live, cities and farmers and everyone, because the rivers flow from the melt of those glaciers. And in the winters, they build up again in the normal course of things. And now they're not doing that. And now they're, they're melting too fast. And so there's, uh, uh, there's this day and there break out floods and horrible things. <laughs> but there's this terrible danger that the livelihoods of a couple billion people <coughs> from China all the way to Pakistan, all around, you know, you have the Yangtze, you have the Yellow River coming from Tibet. But in Plateau, you have, and Tibet, you have the Yangtze coming from Tibet and other smaller systems connected to that. You have the Mekong going down to Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and uh, Thailand. And then you have the Irrawaddy and, uh, in Burma. And, uh, and then you get over Brahmaputra and the Ganges and Yamuna. And then finally the Indus complex going into India, East, West India and Pakistan and West Pakistan. And, uh, and then even the, there's uh, Amudaria, there's some rivers flowing toward Afghanistan that come from that massif, the western part of that, that huge, vast plateau, the roof of the world, as it's called. And now we all know that that's huge. So imagine if they had no water six months, six, seven, eight months of the year, because monsoons are only a few months. What would they, how would they live during that period? It's, it's unconceivable, you know. It means there would be huge... Mill- hundreds of millions of climate refugees is what it means. And how will that be handled politically and otherwise, you know? Hundreds of millions, if not a billion, refugees. So everyone knows that, okay? But this never talked about in the Earth um, environmental people very much. Even my beloved Al Gore, he has a few slides about it, but he doesn't make a big fuss about it. And the reason that people don't talk about it is that China doesn't want them to talk about it because China is accelerating the melting rate of those glaciers, maybe sixfold, maybe threefold. It's hard to make an exact estimate, but all the scientists who have measured glaciers and have gone up and done this and that with instruments, you know, real scientific research and studies, they say 
between three and six times faster than the generalized global warming would be making them melt. And the reason for that is deforestation of eastern Tibet by clear cutting the primor primordial rainforests of around from 10,000 feet and below in the eastern lower altitude part of Tibet, where the river heads are for the Chinese rivers, and clear cutting those forests, which they did for 20, 30 years to tremendous de 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 detriment. Then the failed attempt to do Chinese style agriculture on the high plateau, which created desert areas instead of the grassland. Then using the grassland to make wool and things they could sell instead of the Tibetan nomadic thing dependent on yaks who preserve high altitude steppe land and grassland, whereas intensive sheep Agri, you know, like nomadism or pastoralism, uh, pulls out roots of plants and creates deserts. And then also uh, damming of rivers to make electricity from strip mining of different precious metals and lithium and uranium and so on that goes on in, uh, in especially the eastern part of Tibet, which is huge. I mean, Tibet, you have to realize, is the size of bigger than the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. west of the Mississippi and, or, or even the Louisiana Purchase plus all the Spanish territories of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California, which uh, were not in the Louisiana Purchase. The whole of the U.S. west of Mississippi, that huge land, Tibet, the, the third pole is that size. The Tibetan Plateau is that size. Tibetan Afghani Plateau. So the mismanagement of that environment, and in ancient time, the emperors of China they never tried to colonize it because they realized it was their headwaters. They had legends about the gods being up there. The Indians whose headwaters are up there, they never tried to colonize it. It was too high for them. And also they thought it was the abode of gods and so on. And so, and you can, and there's only 47% of the oxygen that a sea level or, or you know, a 5,000 foot person has, you know, in normal places where people live. So it was always sparsely populated to bed. And the Tibetans kept it that way. They had 30% of the population, 20 to 30% were monastic, meaning celibate, didn't have children. And they kept their population balanced, and they didn't have big cities, and, uh, and uh, they, uh, they thrived there, and never had a famine or anything. They uh, were quite wealthy, actually, with the nom nomadic pastoralism, farming combination, mainly pastoralism. Yaks were the main tool, that, the main helper that they had. Because yaks, you know, one thing you should know, yaks don't bite the grass and pull the root out. They have a rough tongue and they lick it. And they lick the blade off the root and, and, and their drool, I guess, strengthens the root. And so they maintain impeccable, green, wonderful grassland at 13,000 feet, way up, almost up at the tree line. And they are so, such good grazers, you know. Or they're not actually called grazers in, in, in agricultural speak. They're called browsers. What they do is they browse the grassland. They don't graze on it. <laughs> like we do in bookstores. So, okay. So, 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 in other words, in the environmental awareness thing on Earth Day, we, whose mission, we're not necessarily that good environmentalist, although I got trained by Al Gore, I'm a client reality project leader, speaker, you know, allowed to give that speech that they do, the inconvenient truth speech. Actually, the convenient truth, the wonderful truth that is helping us so much. Dear Al Gore, really, what a, what a great thing it would have been had he properly had his win, narrow win as a president against the oil industry and not been dethroned and robbed in Florida as he was. And then he being having written Earth in the Balance in the 90s and having pushed all through the uh, Clinton administration to try to get major remediation going about climate change already then, 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, uh, we'd be in a much better place now. You know? But anyway, he continued with his wonderful teaching, who taught five, six, seven million people around the world the reality and the convenient and the wonderful truth. The saving truth, you know, really wonderful work he has done and does, still does. And um, anyway, so, but, 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 but as I say, they can't do it because China doesn't want them to. So there are wonderful ecologists in China, scientists. They know that China is shooting itself in the foot by wrecking the plateau. 
and trying to populate it and colonize it and settle it with with sort of military business people who just want to rape all the resources. Do you know what I mean? Who are carpetbagging up there, do you know? Because it's not really their country and everyone knows that. Who goes there, whatever they say in international lying geopolitics, you know, they know it's not their land, but they come, they're up there to make a profit. So they're going to cut extra trees. They're going to grow more wool and the land will support. They're going to do what? They're going to bottle water and sell it. And so they're not taking care of the place because they don't consider it's theirs really. And they don't really take, live there, you know, temporarily. But it's not colonizable. That's the whole thing about it. It's too high. Three miles, three kilometers high, three kilometers, maybe I'll say three kilometers high. Average altitude. So um, we are making a fuss about it, and we're not blaming China. We could blame the Communist Party dictatorship, because dictators are the ones who don't, who behave like this. They they get lose touch with the people they are governing and the land that they govern, and they pollute it and destroy it, and they try to suck wealth to the top. And that's why they get along just as well with capitalists as communists. They're not really communists, they're just dictators. So we could blame them, their bad policies, but we're not. What we're doing is we're not mentioning any nation state. Actually, one of the big sources of the melting of the Third Pole glaciers too fast also is the Indians. For deforesting the southern slopes of the Himalayas too dramatically and allowing too much monsoon to spill over up into Tibet and wash away things with more rainfall than they used to have and more dampness, you know, and moldiness and whatever, you know. And and but and more important than that, for their own industrial coal pollution, creating a fine black dust, carbon, etc., in the form of fine black coal dust that creates a terrible blanket, of course, of unbreathable and harmful air for their own people in the plains. But when it gets so when it blows over the Himalayas, it coats the glaciers with this black dust, which then absorb the sun more strongly and create more heat to melt the glaciers faster, for example. So we're blaming different personal, individual and commercial practices rather than any agency of any state. Because we're not a political lobbying organization, we're a cultural organization. As a cultural organization, we're concerned that the culture we're seeking to preserve and to promote and to, to help people in the world value the Tibetan special precious Buddha Dharma culture, uh, the, the homeland of that culture, that high plateau, we, would not, we are not liking to see it being destroyed. So therefore, we are doing special third pole conference within the environmental you know, uh, uh, catastrophes that are waiting in all over the planet. We're focusing on that one as the home bed as the homeland of, of the, you know, not on a geopolitical level, homeland on a cultural level of the Tibetan precious Buddhist culture, which is really the, the Sanskrit Buddhist culture from ancient India that was lost to India and never quite fully spread to East, East Asia or South Asia in its fullest dimension, mainly only to Tibet and Mongolia. Okay, so that's... That, so that's that's uh, that we want people to think about that on Earth Day, pray for the glaciers of the Third Pole as well as the glaciers in Greenland and the Arctic and the glaciers in the Antarctic. You know, of course, we're all praying for them to survive, like the rainforest in the middle and those wonderful balancing on the top of the Earth. They have a huge weight they are. You know, huge balance weights they are and um, disrupt the spinning and the gravity field and everything, I'm sure when they fully melt, you know, it'll be a catastrophe, really. So we don't want that to happen, and we, but we want everyone to join in, add to that the third pole, which is the great uh, uh, Tibetan plateau, basically. It's about just as good a way to refer to it, okay? So that's the thing. And um, really, we should be clear, you know, for example, Russia is a magnificent country, and it's huge, right? It's way over in Siberia, and all the way it goes all the way to the Pacific. And what do they worry if they lose a few Eastern European countries in their former Soviet empire or Tsarist 
uh, which was bigger than the Tsarist Empire in a way because of their uh, post World War II settling down on top of the heads of the Eastern Europeans, and there, which, which is what the KGB people are so upset about, you know, and Mr. Putin especially, you know. But otherwise, it's a huge, great country. They don't even they don't need, uh, you know, uh, Belarus, and they don't need Ukraine. They don't really need it at all. They have enormous resources, huge. And they themselves have a culture that's a huge resource. Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Eastern Orthodox Christianity and, and uh, Judaism. They have, have had wonderful Jewish people there for thousands of years. And, and, they, and therefore, but they have been put into a dictator. They have not escaped. They almost did in the 90s. They tried to escape from a dictatorial type of top-down authoritarian social structure, and they failed to do it. They were undone by the KGB's uh, persistence. The Soviet Union's KGB persisted. That's what, that's what those oligarchs are. They're all KGB people, mostly. And uh, they wouldn't allow the Russians to bring out their creativity and start to make their own wonderful things on the Internet or you know, creative arts or movies or whatever wonderful things the Russians could have been known for by now. No, they turned. They arrested all the creative people who don't like to be bossed around, and they they forced any engineers they had left to do the only military thing, and then they just pumped oil and they turned it into a petro state, a petro dictatorship. That's what they did, the KGB. In order to keep their dictatorship, they imitated the Arabs with their petro dictatorship states, and buying off people freedom by paying the money with the oil money and been living like cutting their heads off when they say anything wrong. And that's, they turned that brilliant, beautiful Russian culture into that. And, uh, and it's having its time. We're now getting a chance. We, and we could have been confused about that with oligarchs rushing out in the West and buying soccer teams and basketball teams and things like that. But now we can see really what that means by the way they are being so completely horrendously war crime, the war crime of the invasion, not just the war crimes during the invasion, but the war crime, the invasion itself is a war crime. <clears throat> and we have to, we as Americans should face that Cheney Bush too, invasion of Iraq, second invasion, not the first one getting the Iraqi dictator out of the, who had been our ally, getting him out of Kuwait. That was justified within the world system because he invaded Preemptively and and unprovokedly, Kuwait is to get more resource, and but then the second one where we invaded the country which had not attacked us, they did not attack us on 9/11. They were actually less, uh, you know, fundamentalist religious fanatic than the Saudis are, our allies. They they were more secular, although they were dic under authoritarian dictatorship. But still, women worked. Women were doctors. Women taught in universities, although they they were torturing the the Shiites and the Kurds. But otherwise, the dictator was. But otherwise, they were more secular actually, and therefore less religious fanatic, and had nothing to do with 9/11. They were our allies. That we had been helping them. They were mad because we wouldn't let them take Kuwait. But uh, but uh, still, you know, they were. They were allies, actually. They were allies against Iran, as it turned out. You know, so we did the first unprovoked invasion of somebody, which was which was a war crime. We have to own up to it, you know, as people. We do. We let them get away. They stole the election in Florida in 2000. Then they invaded Iraq, and this reverberated, destroyed Syria. It was destroyed because of the massive dislocations of everything, <coughs> and. Um, all kind of other horrible things happened, you know. So uh, it was really bad, you know. We have to admit that. We also stupidly allowed uh, the Italians and the French under previous administrations to destroy Libya. And then now we see the Russians behaving like that. So we have to not allow our authoritarians to take us over. We have to vote right this year. We have to vote out the climate deniers. By no means should we allow, you know, midterm elections often only half the people vote, but every single progressive person has to vote. I don't care, leftist or centrist, doesn't matter. Every single one has to vote, really, 100%. The same 80 plus million people who voted in the presidential election and squeaked in Biden, 
must vote again. And I think even the MAGA people will not turn out 100%. But there'll be a higher percentage than usual. This will be a much higher percentage because they're stirred up with all the misinformation and all the lies and all the Russian bots. And that's been the, that's been the more successful war that the Russians have engaged in uh, until Putin foolishly tried to send the military into Kuwait, into, into Ukraine, okay, where he's lost everything. So we have to pray for him to not take the world down with him by pressing many buttons as he's going down, you know, as his false, false, falseness is being exposed, you know, and his ruthlessness and callousness and amorality is being, has been exposed, you know. Holy war, as he thinks it, but total war crime. So, and that's, this is a, man, this is birthday, but we can't ignore these it's subjects, you know. Act like we're, you know, we just happy pat the earth. No, earth wants us to try to expose and free ourselves from these kind of authoritarian oil monarchs, you know, and dictators. We really do. Dirty industrialization. Industrialization could remain to some degree. It's been useful. There's such a thing as clean industrialization that doesn't use coal and oil and gas, that works with electrical power, maybe hydrogen, maybe fusion, maybe even nuclear is actually... Not that bad if it's done right. Thorium, nuclear, uh, we shouldn't be so precious about it. And, uh, but but uh, renewables, basically, are what we are ready to do, and we're going to do that. But we must also see the opposition and see what it is. And, try, and, and not hate them, but try to relieve them of the burden of destroying life. <laughs> That's all. Prevent them from harming themselves by wrecking the planet. More wrecking the planet. Just for dollar bills, money, columns of mathematics in a, in a, in a, in a, in a ledger, you know. No other reason. They don't need all that. Whatever they're doing. You know? A billion dollars is enough for anybody. Even, even a million is enough. Okay, a few million would be okay, depending on the level of, of uh, inflation. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the Earth. And then here's the thing that finally, my final point on, the, on Earth Day, it comes back to the preliminary point, which is where are we, what are we, or in the famous words of Admiral Stockwell, where am I, what am I doing here? <laughs> and where we are is we are in the human life form, and we are human beings on a wonderful planet, green jewel planet. It's a jewel in the universe. There's a billion of them in this galaxy alone, but, but still, each one is precious in itself. And the thing is, that's just our temporary form. When we die, we're going to be some other kind of animal. And we, we don't necessarily have to be come back to this planet because there's many other planets, actually. Many, many. But, and you can, when you have a very pure energy, super subtle energy body and a dreamlike mind in the between state after death and between death and rebirth, you can go light speed, warp 20, warp 100, warp a million. Boom, it's the speed of thought. And because you're not dragging any kind of heavy substance. You're just pure energy. And so you can go to other planets, you know. But uh, this one is particularly great, and we have loved ones here, and we'll tend to come back to this one. If you're an oil sheik, if you're an oil dictator, an oil oligarch, you'll still come back to this one. You, you, you will die in your high-tech refuge in New Zealand or up in uh, British Columbia or in Labrador or something or on Greenland. Trump wanted to run away to Greenland. <laughs> Had to buy it. And, and you can hide up there, but you're going to die. Even, even you live out your natural lifespan there. And when you're reborn, you might not be attracted to whatever female is in your same shelter. As a mom, if you're, going to be, if you're lucky enough to be human, or uh, you might be reborn in one of those hard, horrible climate, uh, extreme weather event stricken places. And so you're going to be stuck here. 
So one of the key things that doesn't motivate people to really see to it that we really turn off the filthy, dirty coal mines and the coal factories and etc. Uh, and the, and the, the petroleum refineries and things, tar sands, really disgusting stuff. What we don't really insist on it is that we are all stuck in this ideology, false religion of scientism. I'm not talking about science because we love the scientists, but the scientism, the overarching theory that there's no mind, that there's no soul, that you don't get reborn, that you haven't had previous life, that and therefore you automatically have the nirvana of being anesthetized in a permanent unconsciousness. And nothingness means that you just you are nothing already and you revert to your natural nothingness is what they promise you. But then just ask any one of them the question, who discovered that nothingness? You're a scientist, you're supposed to go by what you experience, what is empirically findable by you. You're not supposed to have dogmatic theories like high church theories. And since none of you have discovered nothing, since nothing we can know by common sense can't be found. <laughs> it isn't a blank space. Nothing is not a dark space. Space is not nothing. Space is an area. You know, cosmic rays go in and out of it. Micro things are in and out of it. It's, a, it's something. Nothing is not something. It's nothing. Okay, so it has no spatial dimension. It has no time dimension. It isn't there. It's a non-referring word. So you can't go there. Okay, it's as simple as that. And anybody who assures you that any talk of rebirth, going to heaven or hell, being reborn as a human, being reborn as a horse or a donkey or an armadillo or a crocodile or a fish or whatever, it's just a su religious superstitious. No. Uh, they are more reasonable than someone who superstitiously says, I'm going to be nothing, when there's no such thing, which it's impossible to therefore be something that isn't something. <laughs> you follow me? You can't be it. There's no boundary between nothing and something, because nothing is not a space, it's not a place. No there there. So you'll never get there. And you're not there now. And you have a mind. And you have a deep, subtle mind, like a core mind, like a spiritual or mental DNA, like a really tiny, invisible thing that's like your sort of core habit. It's a shape, it's a shape of your core habits or something. And it's yours. And it will go on and on and on. And until you understand it, and you understand the world it's in, and you really love it, and you enjoy it, and therefore love everyone and everything in it, you will go on having a hard time. On and off. Okay? So that's what we're here for. That's the purpose of it. And once we know that's the purpose, and once we know that we will live with the consequences of our behavior in this life, we will continue. There's no dead people. Nobody stays dead. Death is just a doorway from one body to another. It's like when you fall asleep at night, you know, you, and then you have a dream, and then you cease the dream and you wake up. Well, where were you between when you were in a deep sleep before you rose out in the dream and where you were in a deep sleep before you woke up in your ordinary senses when you awoke? Where were you? You weren't nowhere. You were, your body was lying somewhere and your mind was therefore in a dormant state, a sleep state. But you, it was still your mind. It was just unconscious. Normally, although actually you can learn to be conscious, even you can develop such a subtle self awareness. You can even learn to sort of be consciously unconscious. And similarly, that's good to you, and you can learn to be unconsciously conscious. And that's really good because it keeps you resting. The rest channel in your conscious being keeps you going when you're conscious. Do you follow me? You're, you're subtle enough to, to tolerate that ambiguity of being conscious and unconscious and being more conscious of the unconscious part is helpful to you. You can learn to do that. It's not too hard. Some people naturally can do it. You can learn to do it. And it enables you to stay cool and stay calm and stay healthy and enjoy your life more, which you should do. Earth Day should not be a time of anger. It could be a time of vigorous protest. 
But believe me, when the, the oil oligarch or the crooked politician who is bribed to vote for them, even knowing it's the wrong thing to do for life, the crooked one, you know, uh, even that one, when you are protesting against them and saying, no, 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 no Joe, no Charles, no, 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 no Rex, when they say that, but you're doing it in, with a smile on your face, in a humorous, although it could be loud, you could shout it, but it would be loud, but it's not hate. You're not hating them. You're not calling for them to die. You know, you're not, you know, kill. You're not putting up hangman pets. You're not. You're not angry. You're vigorous, forceful. You're hot even, but not angry. In fact, you feel more sorry for the evil doer than you do for the victim. Although you'll work to protect the victim against the evil doer. But one of the things that gives you energy to protect is you're more sorry for the evildoer because the evildoer is harming themselves when they harm their victim. It's like Putin. What, where, that guy, he can't walk down the street in Moscow now without a huge bunch of bodyguards ready to beat up anybody who looks crosswise at him. He's completely isolated now. He's, and he's afraid of his bodyguards even. He's afraid of them. They might turn on him at any minute because he's been completely invalidated. No more Mr. Cute out there with a bare chest riding a horse. No, he can't, won't be able to get away with that after killing off people's relatives in the Ukraine just for his own vanity. So he's ruined himself. After we have to feel compassion for him, but although that compassion would, could, should take the form of stopping him by all necessary means, but not hating him. That's really, maybe you think that's impossible, but it isn't. It's not impossible. You can be vigorously oppose somebody without hating them. You can learn, in fact, you can oppose them much more effectively. Once you hate something, you just go berserk, you know, and you lose your judgment and how you're doing what you're doing. Everybody knows that now. Everybody's doing mindfulness. So we're being mindful Earth, okay? So... I have a plan for the day. Go to the meditation starting right now with Los Antemba, who is presently, I think, in yeah, he's in India or someplace. He had to run away from the police in Russia. For me to help you with that. And uh, thank you. That's very kind. You need an app for me to help you with that, he says. And so you need an app. So go see Tibet House and do the, do the Earth Day meditation with him which will be better than your one with me. I'm just telling you stories, okay? Los Antemba, his name. You know, Gelong Los Antemba. The mendicant teacher at Los Antemba, okay? Via www.thus.org or tibethouseus.org. Okay, thank you so much. Happy Earth Day. May we pray and dedicate the merit of talking and listening to ourselves and to each other. And uh, I like to learn from you when I can. And uh, my son brilliantly said, the way of really being a teacher is when you know you're learning from the people you're teaching and you're learning with them. That's the thing, that's the best way. He's so good. And uh, okay, so please uh, do that. Have a great day. We dedicate the merit to Mother Earth that she be saved, that she continue to serve all life in the beautiful way that she does. And uh, and even she can go on and be a Buddha later. It's okay. No rush. And uh, that, that future time is there. The minute she has that determination, it's in a way already there. The illusion of long time is just an illusion. Okay? So, and may everyone become such a Buddha. May everyone be a planet for everyone else. Feed each other and make each other happy. And make be equal, all of us, one and another. Okay? That's our dedication. Thank you.